What is up? Hello and welcome to episode 121 of Chairside Live. We've got a good episode for you today. We have part two of my interview with Dr. Todd Morgan. Todd's going to talk about how to identify patients in your practice who could benefit from snoring and sleep apnea treatment. And he's also going to introduce us to the Apnea Guard, a product that he himself developed to kind of standardize uh, the treatment or the anteriorization uh, of patients' appliances between the dentist's office and the laboratory itself and something that can act as a a temporary uh, appliance as well while you're waiting for the permanent one to come back from the lab. So some great stuff there from Dr. Morgan. We're also gonna take a look at a case of the week. I've been getting a lot of requests and just a lot of questions on the road about wanting to know exactly how a Brooks or Crown is fabricated from start to finish. And so we're gonna take a look at that process so you can see as it begins in the design phase or even before the design phase and works its way all the way through to a crown that's gonna be shipped out to your office. But before that, we have a piece of viewer mail. Dr. Peter Corporal writes in and says, Mike, um, uh, thanks for the job that you do teaching blah, 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 blah. Some nice words, thank you, Peter. Uh, the question I keep asking myself in the impression technique after your preparation technique, is it light body and then medium body? Or is it light body and heavy body? Or is it medium body and putty? It's uh, D, none of the above. Um, It's actually uh, medium body uh, in the syringe material and then heavy body in the tray. And so the reason I went to medium body as a syringe material, which is, you know, not even what most companies market that for. Most companies have a light body or an extra light body um, that they use for the syringe material. But what I found was when I was using uh, light body that I was getting a lot of tearing when I was going to remove the impression. So I was getting material into the sulcus where I wanted it. But then when I removed the impression, I was getting tearing of the material and part of the impression material was staying uh, subgingival, which wasn't the problem. We would remove that because there was still a cord down there. But I was losing out on a lot of valuable information by having that impression tear off. So remember, it's all kind of predicated on the two core technique. And in that technique, we place that double zero cord very early in the prep sequence. And when that first cord goes in, all it really does is retract the tissue gingivally, you know, away from the crown margin. So the first cord does a great job of vertical retraction, but that's all it does. And so when I used a one cord technique in school, like I was taught, we would put one cord in, it would retract the tissue so you could see your margin really well. But then when you went and removed that cord, not only did it cause bleeding because it was the last cord that was in there, but there was no lateral retraction of the tissue and so you didn't have a wide open sulcus to get the impression material into. And so with the one core technique, it's a real struggle to get a good impression because you're not creating any room for the impression material. The impression material literally has to push the tissue away from the tooth. But with the one core technique, you also have a sulcus filling up with blood because you've got that cord against the inflamed base of the sulcus and now you're pulling it out at the end. So with the two core technique, the double zero cord goes in first, no medicaments or anything on it. It retracts the tissue vertically and that's great because it allows you to place your margin at that new gingival level. And then you put a two cord on top of it uh, at the end of the procedure. The one I use has epinephrine on it uh, for any patient that can handle epinephrine in a local anesthetic injection. And that's the cord. When you put that second one in, it just barely moves the tissue vertically, but it creates a ton of lateral retraction of the tissue away from the tooth. I leave that in place with one of those copper caps on top for eight to 10 minutes, pull the copper cap, pull the top cord, and we have a wide open sulcus Literally, I mean, it it looks huge when you magnify it on a screen. And at the bottom of that, we have that double zero cord still sitting in place. We have no bleeding because that double zero cord is in place. And into that wide open sulcus, that's where I put the medium body material. Now, when it goes into the sulcus, it's going to be in contact with that double zero cord. So that when you go to pull the impression out, you've got two forces here. You're pulling the impression this way but the cord has the impression material set on top of it and it wants to stay here. So it's stretching that impression material as you go to remove it. With the light body material I was using, it was tearing with the heavy body. When I go to pull it out now, it will, and the cord wants to stay down, it'll usually peel right off the cord. Sometimes it'll pull the cord out with it and that's fine because it'll start bleeding now, but the impression's already done. Best case scenario, the cord stays in and we can remove it at the end of the appointment uh, so that we don't leave any temporary cement in the sulcus, which could cause gingival recession or just very irritated gingival when we go to cement that restoration. Uh, As long as that double zero 
cord is all the way down in the base of the sulcus, it'll just be hanging onto the end of the impression. It won't be embedded in it and difficult to remove, so it's not a big deal. By the way, just happened to get an email today from a dentist who I respect a lot, who's take, who takes very good impressions and has for years, who's just switched over to a laser and swears he's getting better results on his fits having switched over to this laser uh, as opposed to using a two core technique. And you think, he said, do you think it has something to do with the gingival curvicular fluid? Is the laser doing something like evaporating it and now I don't have any fluid and I'm getting better results? And I don't know, you know, we've seen huge improvements for dentists who are taking kind of so-so impressions who went to a laser to remove and trough that tissue and get a good impression. But this is the first case where I've seen somebody who was taking very adequate two cord impressions and all of a sudden getting, feels that he's getting better fits all along on the margins of crowns, onlays, you name it, now that he's moved over to a laser. So we'll kind of keep an eye on that and see where it's going. Uh, the laser obviously probably a little easier, a little faster to use than the two cord technique. I've struggled with it at times though with the laser because when I go to remove tissue, I lose some of the vertical height and as a result, sometimes I expose my margins. I want a real small 200 micron tip where hopefully I can go in there once somebody comes up with a 200 micron tip for a laser to really be able to go remove a little ring of tissue without losing any vertical height. So thank you uh, for the question, Peter. Really appreciate it. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the case of the week. So here's the production of a Bruxer crown start to finish. This is a dentist who sent us a polyvinyl siloxane impression. So we poured it up in stone. There's the stone model right there of the prep arch. And as you can see, this is being put into a three-shape scanner. We want to get this into the digital environment as quickly as possible because everything works better for us in the digital environment. It's so much more consistent. Um, if the dentist had sent a digital impression, then we would start right from that. But we had a conventional impression, so there's no really good impression scanners out there on the market, so we still have to pour the model in stone, and now we're gonna scan it and bring it into the digital environment. So it's gonna look like the dentist took a digital impression in the mouth, it's just that we had to do it ourselves, And it's not quite as accurate as if the dentist did it in the mouth, to be honest, because there's distortions in polyvinyl and dental stone. There's the articulated model. So now we're gonna be able to scan that from the side, and now we can see exactly how much reduction we have between that prep tooth and the opposing tooth. No more guessing on our part. And this is one of the big benefits for dentists who have uh, digital impression scanners is that they can see the reduction actually in the mouth. We're gonna mark the margin here and move it around and try to be true to it. As long as the dentist has left us enough room, which this dentist really did, you can see we've got an ideal anatomical pattern that it's gonna propose uh, for that particular crown. If there's not enough room, then it has to start making changes. We can make little changes here uh, per the doctor's request if we need to on the contacts, but most of the time with us designing it the same way every time, most doctors don't have, have us make many changes. You can see that the different crown designs here are all being nested. These are all gonna be A2 crowns, for example. And so unlike Emacs, which is milled in a small block, Bruxer crowns are milled from a big white hockey puck. So we do a bunch of shades, a bunch of crowns at the same time. So here's that one. You can see there's a barcode that has to be matched up. That's the enlargement factor uh, because it, believe it or not, you know, one of the things that we hear about these crowns is that, oh, they fit better than any crown I've had before from you guys. The amazing thing, as you can see here, they're milled roughly 21, 22% bigger than the final crown's going to be. And that's what the enlargement factor refers to. So there's an exact factor for each block based on the weight and density of the zirconia. Once that's been measured, that's what that barcode tells the milling machine so it knows exactly how much bigger to make those crowns. You can see they look huge. They look like veterinary crowns. They don't look like human crowns and they're gonna shrink while they're in the oven and amazingly they're going to end up fitting just fine when we go to when you go to try them in the mouth so they're uh, cut, cut sprues are removed they're cut out of the disc and they're put on those little alumina oxide balls that you can see there because these are going to shrink roughly 21 percent while they're in the oven for nine hours we need those little ball bearings to help so that when the crown actually shrinks there's no contact between the tray and the crown or else it would distort the shape of it so this way as the crowns uh, shrink during the nine hours center, those ball bearings roll underneath the crown. So the crown ends up being exactly the same shape. It just shrinks by whatever, 21 to 22% based 
on the exact enlargement factor uh, for that particular block. Once it comes out, we do a little sandblasting to get it all cleaned up, and now we're gonna put some uh, color on it. So this is some staining that's being done to match whatever color the dentist uh, uh, has requested. The block started off as an A2, but there's still a degree of uh, uh, characterization that needs to be done. Uh, typically, we're gonna have some uh, translucency by the cuss tips, and we're gonna have some uh, increased uh, chroma in the gingival third. Here we're spraying the glaze on. This is what Rella and Gordon Christensen aren't huge fans of because that glaze we put on there that makes it look pretty when it comes out of the oven, that glaze actually is rougher, has bigger particle size and is rougher than the zirconia oxide underneath it. And so really the only reason that a Bruxer crown initially wears opposing enamel is because of that glaze on the outside. And as a result, Rella has asked us, is there any way you can guys can just polish the outside of those crowns? So for any doctor who asks for it, we do just polish the outside of the crown without any glaze. It's not as pretty, but it doesn't wear uh, the opposing at all without the glaze. As part of our quality control, we use the Vita Easy Shade to verify that it is in fact an A2 crown before we send it out to the doctor. Everybody sees color a little bit different, and that's why we like this computer device to make sure that uh, we're sending out the crown in the exact same shade that the doctor requested. What's interesting, sleep apnea is usually not diagnosed immediately. You know, it takes 10 years on average for a patient to be diagnosed. From really? the time they have some snoring, it gets a little worse, and now, you know, these the breathing problems are occurring. Finally, you're tired and your wife's fed up and they make you go to the doctor. Now it's been 10 years of damage to your heart and cardiovascular right. system. So those 10 years, there's a lot of damaging, uh, damage occurring. So if you can treat patients early, you're gonna offset all those damages that have occurred. It's like getting somebody in a occlusal guard before they grind exactly. all their teeth away. Yeah, pretty much the same thing. Right. So the earlier, the better on the treatment. And um, you know, again, I, you know, this is not a tough thing to do. It's so easy, so enjoyable for me. There's tons of patients out there. You'll never run out of patients. Mm -hmm. If you just look in your own practice, you'll find patients. Establish a relationship with a, with a doc. They'll enjoy the relationship too. Mm -hmm. Go and you go with the, uh, you know, like you said, I, I'd like to take care of your problems for you. Right. And try me out and help me learn this right. field and partner up. It, se it seems like a neat opportunity because you're going into, and I don't know what the sleep physicians do when the patient can't tolerate CPAP. I mean, they must just be like, uh, can you try it again for another week? Here's a new, <laughs> here's a new mask. Yeah. And, and, and then maybe surgery, you know, which sounds like a pretty radical approach. And then you've got the patient who's probably not all that happy because they're still snoring and they don't feel that yeah. good. And you get to come in and go, hey, look, I, I'm just gonna try to, you know, help both of you out. Like you can, so you're just coming in with nothing negative, something easy. Are we talking about two alginates basically and maybe a bite registration Basically, here? that's it. You have to know how to do a good impression. We all know how to do that. And take a bite record in the proper position for the jaw. Uh, there are systems for that that are very simple. And you're ready, you're ready to go. You order the appliance. Uh, you know, Glidewell has several appliances they make. Um, there are several other appliances that I use that Glidewell doesn't offer. And they all work basically the same way. We're protruding the jaw, we're pulling the tongue out of the way, and um, it works, it really, really works. So when you pull, when you move the lower jaw forward and hold it there, that also moves the tongue and all those muscles forward with it? Right, and I tell a patient, it's a tractor trailer. You know, when you move the jaw, the tongue's attached and it pulls the tongue forward with it. Because the tongue is what's falling back and blocking the airway. So you pull it forward or you can blow air in and push the tongue that way. So essentially- That's what CPAP does is blows air in and pushes the tongue forward? That's right. Okay. So it's, we're doing the same thing. You gotta move, get the cork out. Right. Move the cork aside get some air going in and out. It's just two different ways of doing the same thing. Okay, so it, it's the tongue that is really causing the issue, the cork, if you will, going back over the trachea and not letting the air go in. It's almost always the case. Um, there's always exceptions like big tonsils and you know, a, a big fat uvula maybe, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we've all seen those, right? Right. So um, there are exceptions, but most patients have base of tum tongue obstruction. And if they do, we're gonna do well with oral appliances. Uh, for a long time, we brought all comers in, did oral appliances on them, 
and of course some fell out. Mm -hmm. And we try to figure out why. Why did they fail? These patients do great, these patients get a little effect, and these do nothing. And so we're, like I said before, we're working that out and we're gonna get better and better at, at selecting the patients. And because, you know, the dentist uh, mantra is, you know, fail, there's no fail. Right. Right. Uh, it, you know, we take it personally if our right. crown fails or whatever. So in the medical model, what does the physician do? If that drug doesn't work, oh, let's do this one. If that surgery didn't work, okay, here's another surgery. You know, so there's no guilt. You just move forward with the next logical treatment for a patient. Mm -hmm. And that's foreign to a dentist. It kind of is, yeah, you that's know? not how we think. And, and so you've got to let go of that and say, I'm treating a medical patient. This is the treatment I can offer you. It's the best thing for you right now to try. It may not work. Right. And you got to be comfortable with that. Right. Right. And it fits right in with your, I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, don't this know. is all just honesty, and yeah. they don't expect us to be the superhuman creatures or the, or the, uh, the uh, being able to make every crown of an ear fit or whatever and not be sensitive. Like, we yeah. are kind of trained in dentistry with this whole 100 micron margin thing, right. which is kind right. of crazy. And the patients, it's amazing, Mike, the patients don't think the same way about it as they do their crown, okay? Yeah, it's a medical patient, they have a different attitude. Mm -hmm. And you say, you know, we're gonna try this treatment and they don't expect that it's gonna work. You right. know, if you just say up front, you know, your odds of this working are 70%. Seven times out of 10, this will work beautifully for a person just like you, but three times out of 10, it may not. And so you just set the stage and you have to become comfortable right. because you'll fail sometimes. But they're probably okay with that. Those are great odds in Vegas, you know, yeah. at a craps <laughs> right. table or horse racing. Uh, those are pretty, uh, pretty good odds. Patients wouldn't be as comfortable with. Um, there's a seventy percent chance this crown will work. Yeah, right. yeah and, and stay on. And that's yeah. not the way that we're trained to think either. Um, you mentioned the sleep centers uh, once or twice. Um, talk to me a little bit about um, when a patient should go. Uh, for a sleep study at one of these sleep centers. I know that you've also got, I remember seeing you use some at-home sleep tests where people right. would bring something home and s sleep with this. Is this indicated on every patient that comes into practice? Because it sounds to me like it's pretty important to know whether or not this is annoying snoring or progressive, incurable, chronic, potentially life-threatening sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent point. So. What the new dentist has to understand that questionnaires are extremely effective at finding these patients. Really? So um, there's some questionnaires that are on the internet that sleep docs use, that physicians use. If you score this way, you have a high level of suspicion, and then you should go for a sleep study. So you use questionnaires first, mm -hmm. and then you find the patients, and then you can do several different models of practice. You can then say, I think you should go see the doctor about this problem. I think you have sleep apnea. He'll probably test you. If you have a relationship with that doc, you probably send them back if they have the right kind of apnea that oral appliances can address. And so that give and take is always important. Uh, another model would be that the dentist owns a home sleep study device mm -hmm. and they can further screen the patient and test them overnight and say, okay, now we're sure you have sleep apnea. And there are models for the dentist can then get that home study interpreted and uh, by a remote physician. Right. Uh, signed off to do an oral appliance, or then you send the patient off to the lab at that point. They may have severe apnea, and you really don't want those kind of patients. You want to do them a favor and get them to the sleep doc. Right. So there's several models, and you can sort of ramp your game up as you learn more and more. Uh, I like the model beginning where you just let the doctor, uh, the doc do all the testing. Right. You know, I just let them do everything for you, and then maybe add an oximeter, right. or a very simple device, so that you can watch the progression of the apnea go away. Right. And then when they're all treated out optimally, then send them for the final sleep study. But in that first scenario that you mentioned, where you send it out and let the doc do all the work, you just become almost a really highly compensated technician, right? Where he's almost prescribing the appliance with you, and you're gonna fabricate it and make it and get paid as much as you are for doing dentistry. Uh, but in reality, he's the one kind of managing the case, right. and you're almost like a dental lab in a sense. You're making an appliance and managing the appliance with the, like physical therapy maybe, while he's got the onus of diagnosis yeah. and that burden. Yeah, and that's true. This is a, that's a very important point. I'm glad you brought it up. The dentist is filling a prescription, basically. So the physician is responsible, and the dentist has to have a referral from a doc with a signed 
order, mm -hmm. just like a prescription for a drug. Um, and now you fill that prescription for the patient. So you're really truly a partner with the doc that way. And um, so take advantage of that and form that partnership and have a, a referral base back and forth and that works out beautifully. But the dentist should not treat a sleep apnea alone. Right. I mean, that's just outside the scope of their license right. to do that. So the questionnaires that you mentioned that are online, it sounds like they're endorsed by some of the sleep societies. So that, having the patients fill those out themselves, it just takes a couple of minutes, I'm guessing? Oh, it's very quick. Uh, while the hygienist is processing, or uh, not, we don't develop films anymore, right. but while they're getting the x-rays done and up on the screen, they can fill this out. It literally takes two minutes. Okay. Oh, and every patient, question. you can just have every patient fill it out for a while and then update it as time goes on. When the, so the, that's the standard of care for kind of differentiating, not snoring, maybe not different, or diagnosing snoring versus sleep apnea, but that's the standard of care for deciding whether or not a patient needs to go a step farther with the sleep study? Right. Uh, on our intake forms, we have a few questions like, do you snore? Um, I, I, has your spouse observed you stop breathing at night? Mm -hmm. There's two or three questions. If they check any of those, then they get a, a formal questionnaire that's validated to detect sleep apnea. And the hygienist will hand them that and they'll do that. And then the lead-in is for me to come in and say, okay, well, I'm concerned about this. You've scored a certain way on this, on this questionnaire. I have a lot, level of suspicion that you have sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna refer you to your physician for further evaluation. And what's the typical patient response? Uh, they're, usually they're surprised. Mm -hmm. they, they had no idea. And so, uh, you know, the dentist should, you should feel comfortable giving that information. It's like, we took your blood pressure today and it was high. Right. Uh, maybe you should go have that checked. So that's the, it should feel very comfortable right? because you're really helping the patient out. They may yeah. have had this problem for a long time. Right, well you mentioned that it takes 10 years sometimes and this questionnaire could be the end of that 10 year period. And if you start feeling crappy very slowly over a 10 year period, it's like the old boiling frog mm -hmm. thing. I don't think you notice how bad you're starting to feel. And you might be the first one when they fill out that questionnaire to go, look, you scored a 17. Um, this is not normal. You know, my, yeah. mo most yeah. of our patients are down around uh, a seven or whatever it might be. Yeah. And um, um, I, th I think you're gonna really uh, see a significant improvement in the way you feel. I, you, yeah. know, you may, you know, it seems like patients might forget what it feels like to feel okay. Yeah, they, they just get they, used to how they're feeling. Right, they take it for granted, they're, they're aging and they, they don't, they just don't think they should feel good. Maybe. Right. And they can, it's amazing. You know, even the patients that come in and they say they're not tired. You know, they, they score a certain way and they okay, they're not sleepy. Then they get treatment, they go like, wow. You know, when I wake up now, I'm not all groggy. I can get up and I'm functional, you know, all day long. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't realize how sick they were, right. basically. And they, that's the kind of patient that really is cool when they come back and you know, how you doing? They say, you know what? I'm having the coolest dreams. I right. haven't dreamed really? for years. They're getting the REM sleep now, wow. or rapid eye movement yeah, stage yeah. sleep. They're dreaming that, like, wow, I had these cool dreams. You know, hopefully they're good dreams. Right. <laughs> but um, that's the, you know, those are the things that you find, wow, that's cool. Really that, cool. that is amazing. And, um, and just kind of to, to sum all that up, you know, uh, it's always fun in dentistry when somebody comes in in pain and they leave not in pain. Yeah. And we don't get that many endodontically treated teeth where they're just, in pain and we open it and drain it and it's like you've released evil spirits from inside the tooth or inside of them. Uh, unfortunately what we deal with a lot in dentistry is somebody coming in asymptomatic and we say we need to do a crown on this tooth, it's got a big silver filling and we do it and then they become symptomatic yeah, yeah. and that is part of where that guilt and a lot of the stress in dentistry from post-operative sensitivity comes from. Then you look at these patients and again, they're, they're coming to you, some in pain, some not realizing how bad they feel, but they're only going to feel yeah. better if they get involved with this treatment. So it's almost like taking somebody out of endodontic pain and, and what a great ability to be able to do that and how good that must feel at the end yeah. of the day. And I, I'm still surprised sometimes by the patients that are chronic pain, headache, fibromyalgia, those chronic pain patients, a lot of them have sleep apnea. Really? And All the patients dentists want to run from right. for the most part? Yeah, you know, and they're referred to me, so I have to talk to them, right? <laughs> uh, well, so I say, God, you've got everything on this questionnaire checked off. Yeah, you're not feeling too well, you know? They're and, referred uh, to you, though, for sleep apnea, not right, for fibromyalgia. Right. And, yeah, they've got all these comorbid uh, problems and the headaches, especially these temple headaches. 
those get so much better when you treat sleep apnea because they've been clenching all night long trying to get air. You know, so the headaches get better. Uh, by the way, hey, my fibromyalgia is in remission. Wow. You know, I, the, I'm not kidding. Like, patients get better. They never realized how good they could feel. Right. And they just got some sleep. Right. They finally got a good night's sleep. And that makes you a lot more of a hero in their eyes than if you'd taken out an amalgam and replaced it with composite. Yeah. <laughs> that, well, that's I still not feel like a hero. You know, <laughs> yeah, that's not really heroic stuff. So this is, I mean, just huge quality of life, and it sounds yeah. impressive. Now, um, you showed me um, recently an appliance that uh, you had a lot to do with, the apnea guard. Uh, something that uh, uh, looks to be kind of a trial appliance that helps the dentist, you know, figure out uh, how far for, how far open the bite should be and how far forward the jaw should be when we, right. as a laboratory, make it as a uh, a final appliance. And it gives the patient instantly some relief. You know, when they yeah. come in and you diagnose this, they're able to leave. It sounds like that day with an appliance already instead of waiting a week for a lab to make one. Tell me a little bit about the apnea guard. Yeah, the apnea guard. The onus for that was. The questions that I get from new dentists starting, you know, uh, how do you do the bite? How do you decide where to put the jaw? How much vertical separation do you need? Um, is there a simple way to kind of try it to see if the patient's going to respond? And so based on those things, hearing that for many years, we developed the apnea guard, which is a off the shelf, tear open the package, uh, two trays that slide along a sleeve. Mm -hmm. You put some PVS in there have them bite into it and then set their jaw based on an algorithm that we developed and the patient's treated immediately. So it's just regular polyvinyl impression material inside of there, they bite into it, it sets and that's right. gonna lock it onto their teeth. And, and it's not gonna last a long time, maybe right. a month, but it, you will find out if the patient's a responder right. by using that. So if they're a responder- Before you commit to the big lab fee. And exactly, all, right. exactly. So you can use it as a trial in that sense um, sleep labs uh, may be able to use that as well because it really doesn't have to be fitted by a dentist. The apnea guard is so simple that a, a physician, a nurse, an anesthesiologist, they can pull that out and fit it to the patient in the lab, mm -hmm. test them in the lab overnight and say, hey, this thing worked. Make the appliance to fit right where we have their bite and we know it's going to work there. So it takes some of the mystery out of where does the jaw go? Where should I put it? Right. And that, that's confusing for some dentists. You know, like they adjust it and all of them are titratable. We call it titration when you make the little adjustments right. and to move the, the high rack screws. And backwards and yeah, forwards. Yeah, to find that sweet spot. And so we've taken a lot of the mystery out of, out of doing that, made it very simple. Right. And it's low cost, you know, it's, it's uh, going to be inexpensive for the patient uh, and the dentist to try that. So the sweet spot is we don't want to take them you know, we don't want to take them all the way out yeah. if the symptoms would stop when they were only out, you know, halfway yeah. or something like that, 50% of the way, 60% of the way, whatever it might be. And it's interesting you bring that up because most of the dentists who send us impressions for appliances uh, will take the impressions and send it with a bite, but it's a centric bite, which is kind of silly because we could have done that on our own yeah. with the yeah. wear sets. Yeah. It's really easy to articulate, you know, full models, and we could have done that, and we're just kind of left guessing how yeah. much protrusion uh, they want on this. And so we kind of guess and pick an arbitrary 50% number, but we never get a bite beyond that. And it's sometimes difficult to take protrusive type bites, but this sounds fantastic because they bite into the appliance and then you move the appliance according to this right. formula. It just slides, right. And then you have 30 days to move it where you want. And when it's working for the patient, you take out the inserts and send that to the laboratory and they make a basically a permanent version of the appliance the patient has already that's worn right. and gotten used to. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's exactly right. Good. Um, yeah, the apnea guard is, you know, taking the bite, you, you talked about the bite. The apnea guard can be the bite that you send to the lab, like you said. Uh, construction bites, we used to, I, I remember doing those for uh, functional appliances right, back right. in the day I when I did that, that stuff. Um, so taking a functional bite is not hard. We know how to do that. And there's very simple devices you can use that, for, that are designed for dental sleep medicine to do that. So really the bite is very important. Um, and uh, you don't have to go to the maximal jaw position. Almost never do we put, go way out like that. Right. You know, really you get a logarithmic improvement in the caliber of the airway with just a little bit of protrusion. And in one of the studies we did, I'm, I'm just still blown away by this. Um, tiny changes, quarter, half a millimeter of titration, improve the AHI dramatically. 
So you never believe that a half a millimeter of moving the jaw forward would impact the patient this much. Really? Uh, so you need very, very small changes. You don't need to strain the jaw. You don't, there's no need to dislocate the jaw right. and do all that stuff. So that's, that's the cool part. That's what we're still learning. Right. Uh, that's what makes it exciting because it hasn't been all worked out yet. Right. I, that is amazing that a half millimeter, because the, we're, I, guess, I guess it's a linear relationship, right? The, the mandible goes out half a millimeter and the tongue moves a half millimeter? Well, I, it, it's not really exactly like that. Right. Because it, literally what happens as you go forward, the airway dilates sideways. Oh, on and its that, own. That's, okay. uh, we didn't know that until we could have had MRI images. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, it's all about moving the tongue forward, and that's what I talk to patients about. But really, it's about increasing the lateral width of the airway. And that happens when the mandible comes forward yes. as well. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, the mechanisms of action of the oral appliance is just being worked out too. Okay. Well, that makes sense then to have a trial appliance like you're talking about, because, like I said, as a laboratory, we just guess where to put the lower jaw. And so maybe we put it someplace and the patient's symptoms go away, but maybe we're 30% farther than we need to be. I would guess that the farther you go out, the more you tend to increase the side effects with these types of appliances and maybe the discomfort of getting used to them? Yes, uh, that's true. Now, there is a, what we call a dose effect, just like a drug. The more drug you give, the more response you get. So as the jaw goes forward, yeah, your airway opens more and more and more but there's a point at which you have diminishing returns. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And so that's what I meant by the sweet spot. You right. can actually pass up the best, part, the best wow. position of the okay. jaw. And then there's a vertical component which adds a new dimension to uh, how the appliances work. And the apnea guard has a sort of a system for choosing the amount of vertical for the type of patient you have. Does that change the shape of the airway with the vertical? Do we understand how vertical the vertical Vertical and this? protrusion, yeah, they both do, they're sort of surrogates mm -hmm. to each other. And so they both improve caliber, but you know, nobody's really done the MRI studies or right. CT studies, uh, cone beam studies to look at how the airway changes exactly. We know it gets bigger. Right. Usually it's sideways improvement of the airway, which is really cool. Yeah, well, again, you're going to be giving some courses for us. Uh, Dennis can go to glidewellce.com and check out the calendar, see when you're going to be up here giving your intro to sleep courses. Um, I think it's fantastic. I hope that the people who come to the courses get the opportunity to have a, an appliance made for themselves or a significant other uh, or someone like that to kind of get them started uh, down this road. It sounds like a fascinating addition uh, to a general dental practice. And, you know, a lot of dentists want to be the first one in their community to provide veneers or the first one to restore implants or the first one with a CEREC machine or the first one with a cone beam in it. And it's getting harder to kind of differentiate yourself like that. Um, you certainly have an Encinitas. You know, anybody I mentioned to in, in San Diego County or Orange County knows that uh, what you're doing down there with, uh, with sleep dentistry. So you can have a big impact. You know, you really got involved with the hospital with Scripps right there. And right. so you're very tight yeah. with the whole sleep group over there, which obviously has been uh, a huge relationship as well. Yeah. Now, one side benefit that I should mention is that um, when f patients are referred by the physician, they often become a dental patient. Right. Okay. So, and if they don't have a dentist, then that works out. I mean, I'm very careful about not taking patients. Right. Just in case they have another dentist already who they're right, going to be with. Right. Right. And you know, I, I in that light, you want to act like a specialist. You know, you always send the patient back. Right. Know, to the general dentist. But if they don't, then they may become a patient. Right. But the relationship with the physicians that I've developed, I mean, they are, they're referring dental patients that don't, don't have sleep apnea. I need a dentist. Uh, okay, I know this guy. Right. So, I mean, there is a benefit to spreading yourself out and getting yourself known in the community. With the that, yeah, and, that re and the days of, uh, I think, joining the Kiwanis, you know, to be able to do that, and then all of a sudden, or the Rotary Club, and you're going to have a bunch of people referred to you. Uh, that seemed, you know, to work well in the 50s and 60s, and, uh, uh, but now this is a new way to kind of integrate yourself into the medical community. And again, you're not saying, hey, I need patients, can you help me? You're saying, hey, some of your patients have problems, and I know you know it, because they can't wear the CPAP, and I'm here to help you out. Me, yeah. the little old dentist, yeah. <laughs> is here to help out the mighty physician, and I think that's a great story to be able to tell, and a really great way to create some value for them you know, and get some more yeah. patients over. And you can set time. yourself apart a little bit that way too, you know. And then you start buying some Google AdWords, I'm sure, related <laughs> to sleep and yeah. snoring and things like that. Yeah. And you can see a lot of new patients come. Do you have patients who come to you now who don't get referred by a physician and come to you strictly for the sleep thing? 
Not too much. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because, um, I mean, I, I have new dental patients come in and I screen all of sure. them, right? But uh, I don't advertise for patients to come in because they're, they're, when they come in uneducated and know nothing, it takes a lot of time and the staff time, my time to explain why they're there and I feel like I'm selling. Right. I, and that's uncomfortable for me. But when the patient comes from a physician, that's a golden referral. They're, right. they're there and they're ready to go. I mean, that's it. They, you got that referral and they're ready. So it takes the discomfort out of trying to sell things. Right. When someone comes in for sleep apnea, I don't selling, I'm not selling anything. I'm providing a life-saving service. Right. And it feels good to do that. Right. So it's, it's not... They're uh, pre-sold by the physician. Yeah, they're ready to go. Basically. They were sold the first time when they got the CPAP, probably, that they yeah. had this condition, and now it's just not working, and they're looking to you for a possible yeah. easier solution than maybe the yeah. CPAP itself. And, and when they say an oral appliance, see an oral appliance, and they know about CPAP, they're real happy to see that. Yeah. yeah. Seriously, I can trade this box that plugs into the wall with this strap-on mask uh, that looks like an alien's on my face, as opposed to these two little occlusal guards yeah. that are glued together. These are equal. Oh, I love <laughs> and it. And they might. 70% of the time, I'll take it. I'll yeah. try it for 70%. Yeah. Hope that's, I'm in the 7 of 10. That's great. I love that part. That's yeah. fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Right. Appreciate you okay. coming down. Thanks, I look Michael. forward to getting to uh, know it. a little more about sleep dentistry from you. Sounds good. Thanks, Todd. All right. Well, that about wraps it up for this edition of Chair Side Live. My thanks go out once again to Dr. Todd Morgan for sharing his knowledge with us. I've said it before, I'll say it again now, and I'm sure I'll say it again in the future. Uh, get involved with helping patients who are suffering from snoring or especially obstructive sleep apnea. It's extremely rewarding. It's the most grateful patients you'll ever find. And as I like to call it, it's thinking man's dentistry. It's, it's dentistry, it's productive without having to stick people with needles and drill on them with a handpiece and bend over and have your back and or arm get sore. It's rewarding for patient and doctor alike. So on behalf of everybody here at the lab, the CSL crew, I'd like to thank you for your time and your commitment to quality dentistry.